Hello everyone. Today is um, May 23rd, 2020. It is Sabbath, and so happy Sabbath. And uh, we were looking at last week. Last week we started a a, sing, a, a message. I should say a, a series on a message called the Sanctuary Message, and. Um, and last week we looked at the first furniture, which is the altar of sacrifice, and we, we saw it represented, um, in, the, in, in a literal sense, the sacrifice of the animals, the, the, the sheep, the goats, the bulls, and the rams, and things like that. But in a spiritual sense, it represents a foreshadow of Jesus Christ dying for us in, uh, on the cross of Calvary. And... Um, we looked at its application in the time of the Israelites and its application in the time of Jesus Christ and of today as we should be uh, presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. And now we that we went through the um, altar of sacrifice, we are ready to move to the next pawn, to the next furniture, which is the bronze lever. And again, we are going to look at the uh, application of the bronze lever and what it means uh, and how we know not to be deceived concerning the bronze labor. And so let me start the uh, let me start the uh, PowerPoint. And you know from that picture right here, that picture tells us that um, the sanctuary has three parts. It has the, the courtyard. Or outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. And right now we are actually in the outer court. If you can see, both furniture in the outer court are made of bronze. The altar of, of offering or sacrifice is made of bronze, or at least overlaid with bronze. And the lever is actually called the bronze lever. So we know it's made of bronze. And now we are on the second part, which is the lever. And we're going to see what it is. Now, we don't know exactly the shape of the bronze lever. Even though they make it look like it's round, it could be triangle, it could be a rectangle, it could be a uh, any other type of polygon. We don't know exactly how it was, um, the, the feature of it and the measure of it is. So, now, what is the bronze lever? Uh, that's the first question. And we're gonna have to go to the book. And let me let me switch that right here. We're gonna have to go to the book of Exodus chapter thirty and verse number eighteen and nineteen. And what's the bronze lever? Well, the Bible says, verse eighteen, you shall also make a lever of bronze, with its base also of bronze, for washing. And so, what is the bronze lever? The bronze lever is an is a is a base. Another base is a vasin or a vase of water where you put water for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the, and the altar, and you shall put water in it for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet and water from it. And when it's said between the altar, when it's said between the, uh, the altar, between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, it means this right here. This is where the bronze lever is. This is where the bronze lever is. And so it's between the this is the tabernacle right here, that part, and this is the altar. So it's between the altar, altar and the tabernacle. Now what would happen if Aaron and his sons did not wash themselves? So Remember, God said that they were supposed to wash themselves before entering the temple. And so, what would happen if they did not wash themselves? Well, verse 20 says, in the same chapter, verse 20 says, When they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn off an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. And it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and his descendants throughout their generations. And so, 
what is the, what, what would happen if Aaron and and if Aaron and his children did not wash their hands and their feet, they would die. Uh, and the reason is because washing your hands meaning you want to purify your your um, your actions, you know your hands, your work, what you do, it should be to the glory of God. So when you wash your hand, you're removing all the filthiness of this life. And your feet is where you walk. The type of life that you, that, that you live is a sanctification process. And so you cannot enter to God's presence being uh, being sinful or, in a sense, or being uh, unclean. You have to wash yourself to remove this uncleanness, which the water represents. You're gonna see later on why it remove it, why it removes um, uncleanness from people. But that's the case. You have to wash your hands and your feet, otherwise you're gonna die if you enter the holy place, which you cannot be seen the next time we will meet. Um, what does the Bronze River actually represent? You know, what does it represent? Well, first of all, it represents baptism. And this is why you have to wash yourself. Baptism is a symbol of washing. Now, Matthew chapter 3 uh, tells us, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea <clears throat> and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him, meaning the people, <clears throat> and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming, coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Then, Bible says, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And so, baptism is the word of the deliver means baptism. And verse 14, and John tried to prevent Jesus, Jesus saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is feeding for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. And when he had baptized, and when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold the heavens were opened to him, and when he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alight and, and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so here, here we see uh, baptism. Jesus, okay, when Jesus was baptized, it's not that he needed to be baptized. It's, uh, and I want you to, to remember that part where it says here, where it says, and immediately, and after he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. So he came up. That means he was emerged into the water. And the reason why I say it, to remember that part is because in the future we are going to see something totally different, a different type of teaching that is contrary to what Christ was giving us, giving us as an example. Let's move on. We still talk about the bronze liver. Let's see what we can do now. Now, according to the sanctuary message, where does the repentance of sin is perf um, performed? Where does the repentance of sin um, oh, where is the repentance of sin performed? Typo. Um, Leviticus chapter 1 verse 16, verse 1 through verse 6. You know what, actually. 
let me just um, let me just uh, do this right now. Uh, I had to um, I had to uh, I had to fix that because I didn't want to to be like that. I may forget. So according to the central message, where is the repentance of sin performed? Well, let's see what we can learn. Leviticus chapter one verse one to verse six. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, or of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of its own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burn, burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bull before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's and the priest Aaron's sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and the and he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it in its pieces. Now. Um, why do I bring that part? Is because many people actually believe uh, assume that baptism is where you get repentance of sin, and that's actually not the truth. Because baptism is simply a uh, a public statement that you have um, repented of your sin and you have accepted Christ as your savior, and you want to become and you want to be baptized. But the repentance of sin is done at the altar of sacrifice. We looked at that last week and it's only to clarify that part because some people might assume when you are baptized then you have been forgiven your sins which is not the truth. Baptism is just a public statement of what you have done in the past as repentance from sin. Now let's move on. Um, is baptism a requirement. So the question is, is is baptism a requirement? Um, yes or no? The answer is no. Let's see why. And when I say no, I mean, you will see why I say no. Luke chapter 23, from verse 30 and verse 43, it says, then that's, that's Jesus Christ on the cross. Then one of the criminals who were hanged, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, responding, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received the due, the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Assuredly I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, um, we don't know if that guy, that person was baptized or not before that. We don't know. Um, but we know, but we know that he was living a sinful life. And possibly he would, he would be baptized if he had met Jesus Christ probably like way before but but here on the cross even though we don't know the full story whether it was baptized or not we know for sure that now that he believed in Jesus he would have been baptized but did he have the chance? no and there are cases where where um, when you don't get baptized it doesn't mean you won't be saved in, and that's actually one of them, where he finds Jesus at the last minute of his life, 
and then that's when he gave his life to Christ. And so God would not be looking, oh, he wasn't baptized, so he is lost. No. And, and that's why baptism is not the end of the of the story. And we'll see why. At least baptism by water is not the end of the story. Now, is baptism necessary to be saved? The answer is it depends. It depends. And we'll see some cases now. We looked at that one earlier. Um, and Jesus being baptized. And is that was that necessary for him? No, because Jesus didn't sin. He didn't need to be baptized. But we know he gave us as an example. So we know how baptism is to be, is to be made. Now, that's one of them. Um, if you can do it, then do it. And again, this is Jesus Christ again, as he's given us an example of baptism. And that's actually the second place where it records Christ's baptism. Now, did he need to be baptized? No, but you see, actually, it says when all the people were baptized. So that means the people were coming for baptism. Same, same here and same here too. In chapter 3 of Matthew that the people came to baptize and then Christ also came to be baptized and so he came to pass that Jesus was also baptized and while he prayed the heavens opened and so if you have the if you have the opportunity to be baptized then you should do it now is it a, is it bad no but if in, in certain circumstance it is not bad but if you get the chance to do it then by no means should you disregard it and say well the thief on the cross didn't get baptized so i don't want to baptize that is a false uh, mentality and so so it depends on the situation you are in now let's look at uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 10 to verse 19. That's about Paul saying, Now there was a certain, a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Remember Paul in chapter 9 of, of, Dam of Acts was going to Damascus to get people from the, to get people, to get Jews from, or to get Christians from, from the synagogue and to take them to Jerusalem to be killed. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saint in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who come on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to be a man before the Gentiles, kings, and the, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hand on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. And so he saw he was a, a Pharisee by 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 he was a woman by birth and a Pharisee by religion because his dad was a Pharisee and here he is um, getting baptized as soon as he received the the truth about Jesus Christ and that is what um, people do that's what um, that is what um, Christians do the moment they, they get the, the, the moment they actually uh, encounter Jesus Christ 
they want to give their life to him. And the way you do that is you first repent of your sin and then be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is why it is important that baptism is important. Now, which baptism is a requirement? Remember I said, um, is baptism a requirement? It depends. But there is one of them that is a requirement because there are two baptisms. Let's see. John chapter 3 um, tells us about a man named Nicodemus. He is a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from, come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus said unto him, Most, most assuredly I say unto you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, Well, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's room and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, most assuredly I say unto you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows and things like that and it goes on. Oh, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit and it keeps on going. Now, what does that mean? Um, you see, born of water is, is essential. Born of the Spirit is a requirement. Because you see, all the, um, when Jesus Christ was baptized in Luke chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 3, we see he was baptized with water and then the Holy Spirit came down upon him. And so, Water baptism is essential. A Holy Spirit baptism is a requirement. Because if we do not have the Holy Spirit, or if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will not see heaven. I will say it again. If you do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will not see heaven. Now what I mean by this is, it's not as if, if you don't get it, you're not going to see it at all. Because there are people that never knew about the Holy Spirit, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or, or, or baptism by water at all. And those are all people from the Old Testament. You know? And so they had a different, a different um, set of requirements. But to all of those that have the, uh, the example of Christ being baptized and receiving the Holy Spirit, in Acts chapter 19, or Acts chapter 9, where um, Paul is baptized, and in John chapter 3, where Jesus said to Nicodemus, baptism by water and the Holy Spirit is needed to see the kingdom of heaven. If you reject those baptisms, you will not see heaven. If you accept only one, actually, you cannot accept only one and not the other one. Unless, of course, you are in the case of the thief on the cross. You may receive the Holy Spirit and not be baptized by water. But if you are not, if it's not in a, in a, uh, what you call, if it is not in a, a specific condition, then you need to have both of them. It is essential. And that's how much God is um, emphasizing on water by baptism and Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19 again. Let's look at that one. Uh, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper having passed through the upper regions, came to excuse me, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said unto them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed or baptized? So they said to him, We have not so much has heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. 
And when he said unto them, Into what then? Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance. Huh. A baptism of repentance. That means you have to repent before being baptized. Saying to the people, they should believe on him who would come after him, that is Christ Jesus. And so those that were before, those that lived or that died before this truth came out, they have a different set of requirements. Those that lived to see Christ's baptism and to hear the message from John the Baptist, they were supposed to be baptized by water. That's how it is. When they heard this, verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now all the, now the men were about 12 in all. And so what that means is, um, oh, baptism by water is essential, but baptism by Holy Spirit is the most important one because, again, without the Holy Spirit, you will not see heaven. It's just as simple as it is. Now, what else does the bronze zephyr represent? Well, the answer is cleansing. And it is cleansing, and I will see why it is cleansing. Uh, Let's see. Exodus chapter 40, verse 12 to verse 16. Bible says, Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and wash them with water. And so water is meant for cleansing. Actually, we all take a shower here. We shower in the morning, we shower in the afternoon. That's to cleanse our bodies from sweats, from dirt, from dust, and all these things, and uh, bad odor, things like that. We wash ourselves to keep us clean. Same for the Bible. The bronze zebra represents cleaning. It means, it means it's because you put water, it's for cleaning. And so here, verse 13, You shall put the holy garments on Aaron, and anoint him, and consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest, and you shall bring his sons and clothe them with tunics. You shall anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may minister to me as priest. For their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus Moses, thus Moses did according to all that the Lord had commanded him, so he did. Ezekiel 36, and verse 25 to verse 27. And God says to Israel, and God says to the people, Then I will sprinkle, I will sprinkle, then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And yes, this is what the bronze liver is about. It's to give us a new heart. It's to give us a new beginning, a new person. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, everything is made new. And so yes, and the bronze zipper is to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Let's move on. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgment and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. How? By the washing of water. The bronze river. John chapter 15. And how else can you can you clean people with water? Well, John 15 verse 1 to 4 says, 
I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The word? Let me tell you something. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh, and it dwelt among men. And so the word, when the word speaks a word, it is speaking truth. And Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Thy word is truth. And so you also get cleansed by the word of God. By the word of God, you also get cleansed. And so why not study God's word to be cleansed from all unrighteousness? It's up to you. Now, Ephesians chapter 5, that's another one. I know most women don't like that chapter, but it says this, verse 22. Wives, be sub... Um, <laughs> I think today that's actually a, uh, a curse. He said, you're there ready to kill you, I guess. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be, be to their own husband in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. By the word. The washing of water by the word. And so, the word of God is a bronze laver. It's meant to cleanse us. It meant to wash us away from sin. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkles or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And so, the bronze laver means baptism. It also means cleansing. It also means cleansing. By what? By the water of the by, by the washing of water of water by the word. Hopefully so far it is understandable what's going on. Hebrews chapter ten, verse twenty two. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and, and our bodies washed with pure water. Uh, and this is the bronze liver. Now, you may ask yourself that question. How about infant baptism? Is that biblical? I mean, let's say you were, you were let's say you were like my parents. My mom and dad, they both were, they both grew up in a Catholic church. Um, and of course, you know what the Catholic church believes? And, what they, and that's why I said in the first, the first videos, I am against the Catholic um, teachings, not the people, the doctrine, because they are not teaching the people according to the Bible, but according to whatever they want to teach them. And so... First of all, so what about infant, is there anywhere in the Bible it talks about infant baptism? Can we find anywhere in the Bible where you see little babies, not 10 year old or 8 year old, but newborn babies from, from birth to 2 months to 2 years old that have no conscience, that don't know anything around them, at least except for their parents' face, maybe they can't actually recognize. But, can you actually teach them the Bible? Do they understand the Word of God? Can they make a, 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 a informed decision? Let's see. Is that biblical? Well, first of all, let me bring that to you. Nowhere, nowhere in the Bible will you find babies being baptized. 
nowhere. This is a deception by the papacy. And when I say the papacy, I'm talking about the Vatican. I'm talking about the, the Roman Catholic teaching, the Catholic the Roman Catholic system. It is a deception by the papacy to get parents to baptize the little ones on the pretext that if they died, they will go they will go to heaven. Meaning if you if you baptize your babies right now, parents, and they were to die, then assuredly they're gonna be in heaven. Does the Bible teach that? No. Only God knows which babies are going to be in heaven or not. I don't know that either. Okay? So, or if they were not baptized and they died, they would go to hell. So they kind of frighten the parents that they baptize them now so that they can be in heaven. That's a false teaching from the Catholic Church, from the system. It's a false teaching. As we saw earlier, the baptism of water is not the most important one, but that of the Holy Spirit. So we saw that earlier. We saw that baptism baptized by water doesn't mean anything if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you have the chance. Moreover, an informed decision is to be taken by the by the person being baptized. So baptizing baptizing babies is not a form of baptism. It's a form of deception. Let's see what I'm talking about now. As always, I'm bringing some present truth. The Pope says, God the faith and make it grow. Pope tells about parents at baptism. And first of all, remember I said to remember that that part I we when we read about Jesus Christ, um, when he was baptized, he came up from the water. So that's a immersion baptism where your whole body is buried under the water. But how the baby baptized? Sprinkles. So is that baptism? It's not, friends. It's not baptism. That's why I said that earlier, to remember that part where it says that Jesus came up from the water. That means he was under the water and he came up. That's the example. Now, Pope Francis, Pope Francis baptized um, 28 infants in the cistern in the Sistine Chapel. The Feast of the Baptism of the Lord. Um, no, that's more like the Feast of the Baptism of the Devil, not of the Lord. And it says this, Parents are charged with guarding the faith given to their children at baptism and helping them become true witnesses by example rather than, by, rather than just rules. First of all, that's not biblical. Parents are to guard the faith and give it, or not to guard the faith of their children. They are to help them to grow in that faith, not to guard it. Because the children, when they get older, they get to choose whether they want to keep the faith or get away from the faith. At baptism, it can happen at any time. That's why this one is subtle. Because when you, when you get baptized at birth, then you assume that you have to have to guard their faith. Not the case. By asking the church for faith for their children through... Okay. By asking the church for faith for their children through the sacrament of baptism, Christian parents have the task of helping their children to grow so that they may be witnesses for all of us, also for our priest, bishop, everyone, Pope says during the Mass in the Sistine Chapel. Uh, 
First of all, we don't ask the church for faith, we ask Christ for faith. You see, that's the problem. When we read the Bible and God washes us with the water by the word, we learn where we need to get our faith from. Our faith does not come from the church, it comes from God. We ask God for faith, not the church for faith. We ask God, not the church. We ask God, not the church. That's the deception that people don't get to see because they never read the Bible and so they believe anything that the people say. But when you read the Bible, you will see that God wants us to ask Him to have faith, not the church. Ah, okay, let's move on. Faith is not reciting the creed on Sunday when we go to Mass. So at least they are honest, they have a creed. It is not only this, so it's more than a creed. Faith is believing that which is the truth. That actually is um, not quite the definition of faith. Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That, that, that's the true definition of faith. God the Father who has sent His Son and the Spirit which gave us life. Noting that noting John dropped his feeling of unworthiness in baptizing Jesus. He said, John was aware of the great distance between him and Jesus. However, Jesus came into the world to bridge the gap between God and man and to reunite that which was divided, he said. After his baptism, which was by immersion, should have mentioned that too, Pope, by, which is by immersion, Jesus begins his mission of salvation, not sprinkling immersion, an informed decision, informed decision, which is characterized by the style of a humble and meek servant, armed only with the strength of the truth. Armed only with the strength of the truth, he said. All Christians, he added, are called to follow Jesus' style of proclaiming the gospel. Okay, if we are to follow Jesus' style of proclaiming the gospel, we also need to follow Jesus' style of baptism. You can't pick and choose what you want to follow. It has to be everything. It's all everything or nothing. We are to call to call to follow Jesus start of working in the gospel without shouting or squatting someone. True, mis- true mission, and here is a deception again. True mission is never proselytism, but rather attracting to Christ. But funny thing is, when you want to follow Christ 100%, you will have to call sin by its right name. I wish people could understand that and stop being deceived. Open your Bible, read your Bible daily, and God will make you under, get to understand what's being said in His Word. Don't just listen to some people or someone talking, whatever they want. Nobody is actually proselytizing. What we do is, when we are preaching the word of God, people will be offended because we are calling sin by its right name. So no, Pope Francis, it is not proselytizing. And if you really want to follow Christ as you're preaching right now to the people, you need to tell them that they need to be baptized by immersion, not sprinkling. I wish we would actually do. And you know what? This is what and this is what actually happened. This is what actually happened. That's actually what happened in the time of the Dark Ages. There was a man. He was a Catholic man. His name was Meno Meno Simon. Here it is. Meno Simon. From 1940, from 1496 to 1561. And who was he? Uh, 
He was a Catholic priest or a Catholic student or monk. Yes, that's what you see. <coughs> From the book Greek Controversy, chapter 13, entitled In the Netherlands and Scandinavia. And if you don't know what that book is, I'm going to leave a link below it. It's a good book for you to read, The Great Controversy Between Christ and Satan. The teachings of Luther found a congenial soil in the Netherlands, and earnest and faithful men arose to preach the gospel. From one of the principal provinces of Holland came men of Siemens, educated Roman Catholic, and ordained to the priesthood. He was a monk. He was wholly ignorant of the Bible, and this is what many Catholic people are today. And I have Catholic friends that are ignorant of the Bible. They don't know anything about the Bible. And when I try to open the Bible with them, they get offended because they don't want to read it in fear of leaving the church of God. He was wholly ignorant of the Bible, and he would not read it for fear of being beguiled into heresy. Here is a lie. Here is a lie. Even today, I have many Catholic friends that think if they read the Bible and they get the truth, it will contradict what they want to believe in the Catholic Church, and because of that, they decided to disregard the Bible and not read it. That's what happens. I don't know why, but it happens. And I wish they could understand by looking at the Bible, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, and you, will, and, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But they don't, they like Menor, they, they, they like Menor Simmons, ignorant of the Bible, yet they will not want to open it. Let's see what happened. Well, when doubt concerning the doctrine of transubstantiation. What is transubstantiation? Let me tell you what it is. Transubstantiation transubstantiation is, according to the Catholic teaching, is the change of the whole substance of bread into the substance of body of Christ and the whole substance of wine into the substance of his blood, meaning they can create God. When they take the bread, that means they can create that bread and make it turn into the real body of Christ and the blood into the real, and the, and the wine into the real blood of Christ. They can create God. Can you create God? That's called blasphemy. Ah, when when a doubt concerning the doctrine of transubstantiation, transubstantiation forced itself upon him, he regarded it as a temptation from Satan, and by prayer and confession sought to free himself from it, but in vain. By mingling in sins of dissipation, he endeavored to silence the accusing voice of conscience, but without avail. After a time, he was led to the study of the New Testament, and this, with Luther's writings, caused him to accept the Reformed faith. Amen. Amen. And if my fellow, my fellow if, if my Catholic friends would open the Word of God, they would also find the truth and would seek to follow, to follow Christ wherever he goes. They would have the same reaction as men of Simeon, a devoted Catholic monk or priest. So, what happened next? He soon, af he soon after witnessed in a neighboring village the beheading of a man who was put to death 
for having me baptized. <gasps> so you mean the Catholic Church or the people that they employed, they would kill people for being baptized again? <gasps> That's not shocking, friend. That's not shocking. Because the Bible already said that was going to happen. There, chapter 7 and chapter 8 tells us already that the papacy would be killing all of those that would want to follow Christ. And he was a man who decided to follow Christ through Christ's true method of baptism. And he was being beheaded for that. And so do you think the Catholic Church has changed? No. It still does infant baptism as usual. This led him to the study to, to study the Bible in regard to infant baptism. He could find no evidence for it in the scriptures, but so that repentance so first you have to repent and faith are everywhere required as a condition of receiving baptism. You see, it's an informed decision. It's not blindfolded. It's an informed decision. Well, what happened next? Well, praise God. Meno withdrew from the Roman church and devoted his life and devoted his life to teaching the truth which he had received. In both Germany and the Netherlands, a class of fanatics has risen, advocating absurd and seditious doctrines, outraging order and decency, and proceeding to violence and insurrection. True, when you cannot deceive people, you try to kill them. Menno saw the horrible results to which this movement would lead would inevitably lead and strenuously oppose the erroneous teaching and wild schemes of the fanatics. There were many, however, who had been misled by the fanatics, but who had renounced their pernicious doctrines, and there were still remaining many descendants on the ancient Christians, the fruit of the Waldensian teaching. Among these classes, men were labored with great zeal. And of course, what about, is it biblical? Jesus said this in the book of Mark, chapter 16, verse 14 to 16. Later he appeared to the, to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Here's a question. Do you believe? Do you believe that God has a word that can wash us, you, from sin? Do you believe that if you were baptized when you were a little baby, that you are actually baptized? Do you have you opened your, the Bible to study for yourself to know whether or not you are being deceived or not? Friends, those are questions that people need to ask themselves because many, when it's too late, they will try to return to God. But it's already too late, there is no return. So, the bronze liver, the bronze liver, the bronze liver. What about the bronze liver? Well, the bronze liver is a, the bronze liver is a, it's something for us to know. And that's why we see, we went from Old Testament and New Testament. Throughout the whole Bible, we see the message of the bronze liver. And if you're going to follow Christ truly, 
we need to follow him all the way. And if you are a, and if you, and if you are a Catholic or a uh, or a Methodist or a Lutheran or any of these that believe in baptism uh, not by immersion as the Bible preaches, then and you get to learn that today, then please you need to reconsider being baptized again. Because only an informed baptism is acceptable to God. And I'm talking about people that get to hear the message. If you ever died and never knew about a baptism by immersion, God knows your heart. But when you hear the message and you hear the truth, then and you choose not to do it, then God will no longer look at you as if you had not done anything wrong. He will see that you are you prefer to go the wrong way. And so that was today's message, the bronze lever. And yes, baptism by by infant baptism, it is not biblical. Nowhere will you find it in the Bible. You have to have you have to make an informed decision and believe what you have studied and believe that God can actually save you from your sin and then ask God for the faith, not the church, not the priest, not the pastor, not the pope, not the president, not anybody else, but ask God for faith and he will give you the faith that you need to live in this life. I pray that whenever you get to hear this message that you give your life to Christ. And he will show you what it is that you need to do. He will show you just as he showed Saul what he needs to do. He will show you how to walk before him. And I promise you, Satan will be enraged if you choose to follow Christ. But praise God, Christ is girl Christ has already won the battle against Satan. And so Satan cannot do anything to you as long as you keep holding on to Jesus Christ. May God bless you. Today was May 23rd, 2020, Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to you guys. And next Sabbath, May 30th, May 30th 2020, we are going to look at the, the, next, uh, the next part, or the next, um, the next furniture in the central message, which is the table for showbread. Right now, we've seen the altar of sacrifice, repentance, bronze liver, baptism, and the washing of water by the word of God. Baptism by water, baptism by the Holy Spirit, which is the most important one. May God bless you. Until then, bye for now.